Hey folks, I don't know when you're watching this, but at the time of recording, there is currently an election going on in the UK. And I've been tempted to talk about it a little bit due to some requests, but I refuse. And the reason I refuse is because really, it doesn't matter whether it was the 2024 election that's currently going on, or whether it was the 2019 election, or the 2017 election, or the 2015 election. It doesn't really matter what elections occur in the UK, because the reality of the situation is Britain has way bigger problems than mere elections and parties competing against each other. Because in my opinion, the the British electoral system, Britain's democracy, can really only be described as an absolute joke. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today, why British democracy is an absolute joke. Uh, putting aside the parties, putting aside the current election, elections come and go, it doesn't matter. Britain has a major, major problem with how its elections even function. Okay, and so if you're British, uh, you should know this information because the way that our nation is ran is pathetic. And if you're not British, I think what you'll learn throughout this lecture will have you understand so many of the problems that Britain has and why Britain, why the UK as a country is so dysfunctional. So uh, let's start off with number one, a patchwork nation. So if I was to say to you, guess the biggest problem with the British state, there's, there's many things that you would probably say. Mass migration, right? Uh, terrible economy, uh, a decaying public health care service, right? But all these things are, are sh short-term problems that can be fixed. In reality, if you, if you zoom out and see the bigger picture, the biggest problem with the British state is something that most people don't even think of, and that is it's been too stable. And I know you're thinking, what? It's been too stable. You know, Britain's had constant elections, constant shufflings of prime ministers. One of them was out, uh, outlived the career via a lettuce, right? Uh, we've had referendums. And, you know, the UK is anything but stable right now. But again, zoom out and see the bigger picture. Forget the 2020s, the 2010s. Focus not on decades, but centuries. Because in comparison to the rest of Europe, the UK has been ridiculously stable. And I spoke about this in my introduction on explaining the British class system, but it's actually crazy just how, 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 how little revolutionary thought has occurred in the UK in comparison to the rest of Europe. So for example, Britain avoided republicanism. We still have a monarchy. Now, technically to say Britain avoided republicanism is a, it isn't exactly true. I mean, in the UK, we had a guy called Oliver Cromwell, right? And Cromwell got rid of the monarchy for a, for a while and called himself the Lord Protector, right? And then when he died, his son became the Lord Protector. And uh, they, they insist, no, it's not a monarchy. We're, you know, we're not the king, right? But in reality, it was basically the same thing as a king, right? And eventually, you know, no one really liked him. No one really liked his son. And so we got the British got rid of him and restored the old monarchy, which is still here to this day. So technically, we have flirted with republicanism, kind of, but we haven't had some something that's occurred like in France, let's say, or the United States even, where the monarchy has been completely uh, just gotten rid of and a whole new system uh, came, you know, henceforth thereafter. Right. We haven't gone through that. And, and don't underestimate the baggage that comes with monarchy, even constitutional monarchies like, uh, like, like what we have, which are essentially they've had their balls cut off. Don't underestimate the baggage that comes with that either. But even bigger, you know, Britain avoided fascism, right? Fascism didn't originate in Britain. We avoided uh, national socialism. Britain was nev has never been a fascist state. Uh, we had the BUF, right, the British Union of Fascists, led by Oswald Mosley. But again, and that, that was quite a, a substantial movement for the time, but it didn't take over the country, right? And so we avoided that, unlike, say, Germany or Italy, etc. We, we, have, we have never been a fascist dictatorship. We also avoided communism, of course, you know, unlike Russia and the, the Eastern European states that fell into its, into its arms after World War II. Britain has never been a communist country. Uh, we, we've had communists in Britain, these, these sort of little agents, but they've never really been, the, the ideology has never been taken seriously. 
in the UK, especially considering that the UK became a vassal state of the United States after the Cold War. And obviously that meant that the USSR and thus communism as an ideology was our enemy, right? So we've avoided that. And so, you know, all these countries that I've just named, like France, America, you know, Germany, uh, Italy, Russia, Eastern European countries, most European countries, they've gone through what I call a revolutionary development, right? And that is where, let's say that the country started off blue. It doesn't matter what blue is, it was just blue. Then it has a revolution of sorts, and everything that was once blue now becomes red, right? And then you might have another revolution where everything that was once red becomes green, and then the, the, the new nation builds on top of the old, right? It's kind of like Chairman Mao in China, said that there was four olds, and I can't remember exactly what they were, but it was like old culture, old religion, right, old economy, something like that. And the only way that China would advance and become the new communist utopian regime is if China got rid of the four olds, right? And the four olds were basically what China was, right? And so that's kind of a good example. Like, like a lot of these countries have, have gone through this revolutionary development where what came before it has been overruled and overwritten, okay? But Britain has kind of gone through what's, what I call an iterative development. It hasn't had that sort of revolutionary boom. You know, Britain started off light blue and then, and then becomes a slightly darker blue and then, and then it becomes a slightly darker blue than that. But what came before it is never really got rid of. It's just new things are put on top of it. It's not overwritten, right? And so the UK has laws that go back centuries. The UK has procedures and traditions that 90% of people in the country don't even understand, but we don't get rid of them because they're part of tradition, they're part of history. And you know, that's a big difference between these two ways of development. Revolutionary development is great for modernising, right? Because there's no baggage, but it's terrible for history and historical preservation because the nation forgets who it once was, what its ancestors once did. With iterative development, like what Britain has, it's great for history, right? Because Britain, British people love, you know, uh, uh, tradition and, 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 and all that stuff, but it's terrible for modernising because when you try and change something in a country that, that has iterative development, there's a lot of things from hundreds of years ago that slow you down and hold you back or just don't make any sense and contradict what, what you're trying to do. And that's really the biggest problem that Britain has. It's great that we love our history. It's great that we don't just trash our traditions and become this grey, boring, neoliberal monolith, right? We've, you know, that, that's boring. It's great that we don't do that. But there's a lot of things about the UK that are just archaic, ancient, and to the point where it's just ridiculous. And it's embarrassing, quite frankly. It gets in the way of, of running a country in the modern era. And so I describe the UK as a modern nation forced to bother themselves with a needless Frankensteinian patchwork going back to the medieval era. Right? And I know that sounds so progressive. It's quite like, a, it almost sounds like a progressive statement to me, but I really do believe it. I think there's too many things in Britain from our past that hold us back from being a functional nation today, and m much of it is embarrassing. And I know that many conservative people watching this will go, well, I don't like the sound of that, right? What, what do you mean? Like, what's holding us back from our past? But let's go into some of the ridiculous things that, Brit that Britain still has to this day that we absolutely should have changed because they don't make any sense or they're just ridiculous or, or well, let's get into it. So firstly is, uh, second is unrepresentative elections, right? So the way that British people think that our democracy works is that there's 650 seats that are filled by elected representatives, members of parliament in the House of Commons, right? In the House of Commons, every British person knows the House of Commons. It's the parliament, right? You've got the green seats, the MPs sit in the seats, and we elect the MPs, right? But the reality is, is that this isn't really true at all. I mean, it, well, it is true, but not in the way that people think it is, because Britain is not really a representative democracy, as in the people there, the MPs, in the House of Commons, technically they've been elected by the people, that's not what I'm saying, but the question is, is that, have they been elected fairly, and should they really be there? Now, I, I know what you're thinking, you're probably thinking, 
Alex, just because the parties that you don't like win and the parties that you do like lose doesn't mean that Britain isn't a representative democracy, right? Sometimes in a democracy you lose, don't be childish. But that's not really what I mean. When I say have they been elected fairly, I mean have they mathematically actually been elected fairly? So, for example, I want to go cast our mind back to the 2015 general election. And I'm going to talk about three parties. First of all is the SNP, uh, the Lib, Lib Dems, Liberal Democrats, and UKIP. Right now, it doesn't matter if you don't know what these parties are, who their leaders pictured here are, what they stand for. It doesn't matter. All you need to know is the maths, okay? So the SNP in the 2015 election got 1.4 million votes. That's quite an impressive amount of votes. Over a million votes, that's quite a lot. But the Liberal Democrats, they got 2.4 million votes, a whole million more. Right? So they're obviously a much more popular party. UKIP got 3.8 million votes, right? So way bigger than the other two, but by, uh, by a substantial amount. So you would think then, right, logically speaking, that the parties would go up in seats, right? So the SNP would have, would have some seats, but the Liberal Democrats would have more, and UKIP would have the most out of these three parties, right? Well, get this. UKIP in the 2015 general election, got one seat. One seat out of 650 seats with almost 4 million votes, right? So, okay, that's pretty surprising for, for one seat, for having that amount of votes. But you would think then that, wow, the Liberal Democrats and the SNP, they must have zero seats, right? They must have zero because they got less votes. Well, what if I told you that the Liberal Democrats actually got eight seats in the 2015 general election. Eight times the representation of UKIP, despite having over, well, over a million less votes. Wow. How does that work? But get this, before that was crazy. Guess how many seats that the SNP got with 1.4 million votes? You're not gonna believe it. Think of a number. You're not, I guarantee it'll be, it'll be less. 56. So the SNP got, what, a third of the votes of UKIP and has 56 times the representation in Parliament. Now, do you understand what I mean when I say that the, the elections are unrepresentative? Do you see what I mean now? This actually happened, right? And I, I'm, I'm, these, and I know you're probably expecting me to say, Oh, I actually just made this up. This is just a theoretical... No, this actually happened. Go on. You can go on Wikipedia. 2015 election. This, these results will come up. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so the question is then, like, what, what's going on here? And the re what's going on here is that the UK uses an electoral system called First Past the Post. Right? And the way that First Past the Post works is you artificially split the country up. And if you look at that map, you can see it into different constituencies of roughly equal population, and then you count only the winners within them. So in, in a first-past-the-post system, it's not like the national election. It's not like you have one big election. It's almost like you have 650 little elections that are then added up, and that counts as the national election. Does that make sense? So, you know, under first-past-the-post, it's theoretically possible for a party to get 49% of the entire national vote and 0% of the seats, right? So let's say that this was a country here, right? And you have six seats, right? And so you have six different elections. And for some reason in every seat, this would never happen, but for some reason in every seat, the red party got 49% and the blue party got 51%, right? Well, how many seats would that look like in the parliament? It wouldn't be 49% red, 51% blue. It would be 100% blue. Because technically, blue has won in every single constituency. They've got every seat. And so, in, in the British system, who people vote for doesn't really directly matter, right? What matters is who gets first past the post, who wins the most votes in that constituency, right? You can see where the problem is here, right? So, under first past the post, Constituencies can be gerrymandered. That's not really a, a, a term that British people use. It's more an American term, but I like it. And, and to, to artificially produce more favourable outcomes for certain parties, right? So let's say that these were houses of voters, right? 
And as you can see, there's four, four, four. Four for the blue, four for the red, four for the green, right? So under a normal system, you would expect all these parties to get equal votes, right? Equal seats. But that's, but, but that's not how it works, because if the constituencies look like this, technically the left constituency, blue has won, because it's four blue, two green. In the right, red has won, because it's four red, two green. And so despite all the parties in, in getting equal votes here, blue has a seat, red has a seat, but green has no seats. Do you see how, see how that works? How ridiculous is that? But you can even change it further. You know, if you, if you change the boundaries, remember, the votes aren't changing. Look at the houses. They're the same colour. But you change the boundaries of the constituencies and the, seat, the seats change. Now, the, tops, the top has four, uh, four blue, two red. So that's a, a, blue, a blue seat. The bottom has four green, two red. So that's a green seat. So now the blue and green parties have a seat and the red party has no seats. And again, we've not changed... Again, we've not changed the votes of the houses. All we've changed is the boundaries of the constituencies, right? But you can even make it even more ridiculous, right? Because what if you had four constituencies instead of two, right? And in this situation, blue has won two constituencies, red has won two constituencies, and green has none. And again, the votes are exactly the same. Now it's blue two, red two, green zero, but all the parties have got the same votes, you see? And so... The, the way that the British system works is not really directly representative of how people vote. It's only representative of these artificially drawn out constituencies. And so this is why the SNP, which is actually the Scottish National Party, it's a, it's a party that only exists in Scotland, got 1.4 million votes and 56 seats, whereas UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party, which obviously covers the whole of the UK, got 3.8 and only one seat, because UKIP may have got more votes, but the votes were spread out across the country. They didn't get enough uh, votes in constituencies. They didn't get first past the post, whereas the, the SNP did, right? And so you ha you, in the UK, we have a system where you can get more votes than other parties by two, three, four times, and get 56 times less representation in the parliament. Because in the UK, it doesn't matter how many votes your party gets overall. What matters is how many votes your party's got in each constituency and how many constituencies and thus seats you win, right? It's a ridiculous system. And, you know, so under first past the post, people are disenfranchised to vote for small parties because it feels like a wasted vote, right? So let's say that this was the last election in a constituency, right? And the green is far left, the red is left, uh, blue is right, and purple's far right, right? Well, you know, if you took the far, an average far left voter, you would think that they would vote for the green party, right? Because they're far left, the green party's far left, why wouldn't they? But in reality, if you look at the, if you look at the, the, the voting ratios, that might not be the most intelligent tactical move. Because the far left voter might think, well, look, I want to vote green. But blue could win again, so I'll just vote red instead, right? Because blue won last time. Blue got 35%, red got 30%, so they were close, but green only got 20%. And so if they vote for green again, well, then red might lose. And so you're better off kind of having a soft left, even if you're far left, you're better off having a soft left victory than risking the soft right winning, right? So you have to sort of vote for parties. So, so people can vote for parties, not that they want to win, but just, just for, like, they vote for people, they vote for who they don't want to win, if that makes sense. They don't vote for who they want to win, they vote for who they don't want to win. He, he cares more about blue winning th than, than red winning, even though he doesn't like red. Red is still closer to green. Does that make sense? But also, what about the far right voter? Well, the far right only got 15% in this theoretical election. And so they might think, well, look, I want to vote purple because, you know, because that's the far right party. He's a far right voter. But blue always wins anyway. Right. They get more than they get more than double the vote. So I might as well just not bother voting. Right. So it also leads to apathy. People just think, well, why should I bother voting? You know, the blue party is going to win. The red party is going to win. They always do. Why bother? My vote doesn't really matter anyway. Right. 
it, it's like, why bother getting out of bed in the morning, going to the polling station, putting your vote out and then leaving if you know that your vote doesn't matter anyway? Because you, the, the, it, it's already been predetermined who's going to win. The irony is, of course, that if, if everyone stopped thinking like that, maybe the Purple Party could win. Right? Maybe the only reason why the Purple Party gets so little votes is because the Purple voters don't show up. Right. So, so the, per, the first past the post system leads British people to either vote for parties that they that they don't really like, but they just don't want the, the other party to, to, to win or it leads them to not vote at all. This is not what democracy is meant to do. Right. In a democracy, you're meant to vote for parties, for leaders, for politicians that you like. It's not meant to be a mental mind game where you're where you're trapped in a way. And that is what the, the British public are. They're trapped. You know, first past the post results in an unfair election, right? But power is required to change it to proportional. Uh, but the parties in power benefit the most from per first past the post. And so it continues to remain in place. Basically, this is a system that everyone accepts sucks. Everyone knows it's terrible. But because the parties in power benefit from it, it never changes. So the British public are kind of hostages in an unfair, unrepresentative, ridiculous system. And so the only way that you can influence, have any influence in British politics is by somehow changing the agendas of the two big parties, the parties that benefit from first past the post, and that is the Labour and Conservative Party. And you can do this through numerous ways. You can have internal pressure, right? So you can be a member of the Green Party, let's say, or, 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 or and, and you can join you can join the Labour Party, or you can be a member of a far right party and join the Conservatives. You can pretend to go along with their agenda, but in reality, your purpose is to apply internal pressure to make the party more far left and more far right. Right, that's one way you could do it, or you could do vote siphoning. Right, so you just vote for the smaller parties, no matter what, to scare the big parties into taking on the smaller party's position. So, for example, the Labour Party was scared by so many of their voters voting for the Green Party that they took on a lot of their environmental policies, right? Uh, the Conservative Party was so scared of people voting UKIP, right, the far-right party, that they, that they took on uh, the idea of having a referendum on EU membership, right? And so you can kind of scare the big parties into doing what you want them to do via a protest vote. But the problem is, is that if internal pressure or vote siphoning doesn't work, then the country's just stuck with two massive parties but represent, that represent no one, but they always win anyway. And that's exactly what's happening with the UK right now. The Labour Party doesn't represent left-wingers. The Conservative Party doesn't represent right-wingers. They're both neoliberal parties that are pretty much the same thing. But, but, you, but we can't really get rid of them because people just... People either... Are, become fooled into thinking that they must vote for them, otherwise their vote is wasted. Or they don't vote at all, right? And so we're stuck with, the, with these two parties. And, you know, again, due to Labour and the Conservatives always coming first or second, the system still looks legitimate, right? So in the 2015 election, which we just went through, which for smaller parties was ridiculously unrepresentative, if you look at the top, the Conservative Party got 50% um, of the seats but only 36% of the vote. That's quite significant, but it doesn't look it on a graph like that. The Labour Party got 35% of the, the seats, but only 30% of the vote. Again, it's close, right? The big parties, it looks close still. But in reality, it's the smaller parties that are getting screwed here. Again, UKIP, 12% of the vote, 0.2% of the seats. You have some smaller parties like... Uh, the Democratic Unionist, Unionist Party, they got, they got eight seats with 200,000 votes. Eight, so you got 1% of the seats with 0.6% of the votes. Again, it's ridiculous, right? But again, because, because people only focus on the two main parties, the system still has credibility. So what must happen is that all it takes is one election, just one, where one of the main parties comes second place, or sorry, third place, and the system is smashed completely. If the Conservative Party came third or the Labour Party came third and another party came second, the vote would be split so much that whatever party came first would win all the seats, pretty much. And the system would look like North Korea. 
<laughs> right? It would look ridiculous because you have a party that would only get about 35% of the votes, but would have about 90% of the seats, right? And so that's what must happen in order for this ridiculous system to really look as ridiculous as it really is, right? Uh, and so there's rumour that in 2024 this could happen. I think probably more likely afterwards, but we will see. And so, you know, the first past the post system is obviously ridiculous. It's an obvious, it's obviously absurd. And that's why the only countries in Europe that use it is the UK and Belarus. And when your country is in the same democratic category as Belarus, it doesn't really inspire much confidence. No offence, Belarusians. And I'm using Europe here because Europe is, is our neighbours, right? Europe is meant to be this, this developed first world continent where it's all, you know, we're all f about freedom and democracy. And it's like, well, are we? The UK is in the same category as an ex-Soviet state. Can anyone in Britain really say that, oh yeah, I'm really proud of the first past the post system. This rocks. Come on. It's absurd. And so, you know, but all across Europe, they have a different system. Right? And that, this system is called proportional representation. But the way that proportional representation works is how people think democracy works. If a party gets X percentage of the vote, then they get X percentage of the seats. Right? So you get 20% of the vote, you get 20% of the seats. 30% of the vote, 30% of the seats. 40% of the vote, 40% of the seats. It's proportional. Right? Wow, what, an, what a crazy system. What a, what a remarkably logical system. Right, so, for example, this is the 2022 Swedish general election. And as you can see, the Social Democrats, 1.9 million votes, 107 seats. Swedish Democrats, 1.3 million votes, 73 seats. Moderates, 1.2 million votes, 68 seats. Do you see how the percentage of seats goes up the more votes you get and goes down the less votes you get? Hmm. It's almost like it's proportional. <laughs> right? It's like, it's, like the most, it's like the most common sense system in the world. It's like, yeah, obvi obviously that's how it should work in contrast to ours. And, uh, you, know, but, you know, to play devil's advocate, though, there are some benefits to first past the post. It, because, because outright majorities are common in first past the post uh, systems, coalitions are rare. And so if a government gets elected, they often have an outright majority and they can actually implement an agenda that at least someone wants. In, in proportional systems, it's very rare for a party to get over 50% of the vote. And so you have to form coalitions with other parties and coalitions involve compromise and compromise can often mean that no one's happy in the end. But the question is, is that really worth not being an actual representative democracy? Some people on the right in the UK say yes, because, because they think that there would be a permanent left-wing coalition. It's possible. I would argue, however, it's better to have a government that represents the people proportionally than an absurd, psychologically manipulating system where you have to either not vote at all or vote for parties that you don't want, it's absurd. No, it, proportional is obviously a better system, it's obviously a more democratic system, and that's why almost every country in Europe uses it. This is a system that's used in the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, Poland, Sweden, all the Scandinavian nations, uh, Cyprus. Many ex-Soviet nations use this system. Right? Almost every country in Europe has come to the conclusion that this system is better than first past the post, except us in Belarus, because it's logical. How can you call yourself a democracy when a party gets millions of less votes and has 56 times the representation in Parliament? You can't. That's not a democracy. No, it is a democracy. It's just an unrepresentative democracy. It's absurd. No, Britain needs a proportional system because it's so obviously logical. It so obviously makes sense. Which brings us on to number three, the disunited kingdom. So every, the way that countries formed is that you had these things called petty kingdoms, right? A petty kingdom is like the countries that came before your country that formed your country, right? So you can see here, you know, England used to be Mercia, Northumbria, Wessex, Kent, right? All these, we call these the petty kingdoms. And then they, they united to form England, right? And, and the same thing happened with Scotland, right? Strathclyde, the Picts, etc. But the, prob the problem with the UK is that we're still petty to this day because those, though the petty kingdoms united, 
they only united to form more petty kingdoms, and we never really became a proper country, right? We're called the United Kingdom, and yet, if you, if you go to Scotland and ask people, are you Scottish or British? They'll say, I'm Scottish, obviously. You go to Wales, they'll say, I'm, oh yeah, I'm Welsh, I'm, I'm not British, I'm Welsh. You go to Northern Ireland, well, Northern Ireland, I'm not even going to get into Northern Ireland, that's a different story. But you know, the only place that really sees itself as British is England. And even many English people, I think, would still call themselves English first and British second. The point is, is that we haven't united as a country, we haven't forged a united national identity in the same way that the French did or the Germans did, right? Or, or, you know, we, we're still petty and we pretend to be a country when, when we're not. And, you know, the psychology of nationality is a very, very complex thing, like why, why people refer to, them, to themselves as one thing over another. And I, I don't really want to get into that. But the point is, is that you can tell that the UK isn't really united. We're still petty. The, there's, a, there's a football tournament going on right now called the Euros. And in it, England has a team and Scotland has a team. There is no United Kingdom team. And I've always thought that says a lot, doesn't it? You know, like the UK is a country and everything. It, it, the UK is a country in name only, really. And the way to prove this is devolution, right? So what happened is because the UK isn't really a proper country, places and, and, and the British Parliament is in London, places outside of England and outside of London started to feel like they were being left behind, right? And so... Uh, we started this process called devolution, and the idea was that they would, we would give the smaller parts of the UK, the petty kingdoms, their own parliaments, that, that they can deal with their own specific problems, and their parliaments can have their own members of parliament, right? And so we started off with Stormont in Northern Ireland, and that's the Stormont building there. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, and giving Northern Ireland a parliament kind of makes sense because Northern Ireland is obviously not directly connected to Britain and there's a lot of complex history about Northern Ireland which is why I don't want to get into it because when you start going talking about Northern Ireland you'll be here all day and it'll steal the show but it it, it made sense to give to give Northern Ireland its own parliament to deal with its own problems because the rest of the UK is 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 doesn't really understand Northern Ireland it doesn't really understand uh, many of the problems that Northern Ireland has. And so that made sense. And by the way, you can tell that Stormont is an older building because it looks beautiful, right? We'll get onto the others in a, in a moment. But, you know, we didn't just give Northern Ireland its own parliament. We also gave Scotland its own parliament. And this was much more recently. And uh, the Scottish parliament has the most ugly building, not just in the UK, but in the world. Look at that building. I mean, I know this is a bit of a sideshow. We're going on a bit of a, you know, an architect's rant here. But look at the state of that building. That looks like a building that's been, like, bombed, doesn't it? Like, the windows are all bent. There's, like, weird places of unpainted brick and some parts of the brick are... It's the most ugly building in the world. It looks like, looks like what I produce in the toilet before I flush it. It's an absolute disgrace. But, you know, we gave the Scottish their own parliament because the Scottish voted for it in a referendum, an overwhelming majority as well. They wanted their own representatives to deal with their own problems because they felt like London, Westminster, England wasn't listening to them. And But that wasn't all. We also gave another parliament to the Welsh. And I've got to say, this is called it's called the Senate, right? I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. <laughs> Lads, that is not a parliament. That is a bus station. <laughs> okay, like I do, I don't know what it is. We've all like after af, in the nineteen nineties and the two thousands when we started Scottish and Welsh devolution. I don't know why we built these ugly postmodern buildings. Like if I was a Welshman and someone said to me, "That's your parliament," I would say, "Do you think of us that lowly?" Like look at that. That doesn't look like a parliament. If I was building the Welsh parliament. I would make it like a big Welsh dragon, you know, like what's on the, the Welsh flag, a big red dragon and fire comes out of it and it'd be like a tourist attraction and the wings move and you can, you can enter, you know, the, the building, uh, like, and, and in, it would look like the inside of a dragon. Maybe I need to grow up a little bit, but it would definitely be a lot cooler than a bloody bud shelter. Anyway, uh, rants aside, 
Okay, so this, this kind of makes sense. The petty kingdoms, they still have a sense of nationality. They still feel like they're Scottish and Welsh and Irish. They don't feel British. They feel left behind by the parliament in London, Westminster. And so we gave them our own, their own parliaments, right? But here's the thing. What about England? Because England has more people than Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales combined. We have over 55 million people out of a country of 67 million people. So, so what, about, what, what does the English parliament look like? Well, screw you, we don't get one, right? So Scotland has a parliament, Northern Ireland has a parliament, Wales has a parliament, but England, the biggest part of the UK, has no local representation. We don't have devolution. So what this means is English MPs can't vote on issues that affect Scotland and Northern Ireland and Wales directly. But Scottish MPs, Irish MPs and Welsh MPs can vote on issues that only affect England directly. So we have an, a disunited kingdom that's almost ran by minority rule, where, depending on where you are, your MP will have more power over the country than other parts. Now, again, this is, what, this is why I call the UK a Frankensteinian patchwork, because isn't it common sense that if you give one part of the country a, a parliament, that you give everyone else a parliament? Isn't that the most common sense thing in the world? But no, it isn't. Because again, the British system is run by bubblegum and string, right? We, we sort of, we do it iteratively, like, oh yeah, you can have a parliament, and then you can, and you can. But we don't think about the overall construct and how polished it is. It's ludicrous. And so, look, the, the solution to this problem is very simple. Either we all get a parliament, right? Uh, and by the way, th these are my, uh, considering how bad... Uh, architecture is, is becoming. These are my uh, some of my suggestions for what the English Parliament could look like. I call this one Behind the Bank Sheds, right? It's very postmodern, very beautiful building. Uh, he, he, this is another one, the Mosh Pit, right? Uh, it still looks more beautiful than, than the Scottish and Welsh Parliaments. Uh, you can see it really represents England today, I think. And of course, you've got the Council Flat Fun Zone, right? So we've got a little bit of a tropical element in there as well. Uh, yeah, I think these would be really good candidates for a, a real postmodern uh, English parliament. So either we all get a parliament, or even better, you, know, you can split England up into the North and the South and the London and give each part of that its own parliament, because maybe England is too big, right, So in, in comparison to the rest of the country. So either we all get a parliament, or no one gets a parliament, right? That's what you have to do. You can't give some parts of the country... Better, better, a better deal and better rules and, and, and give them their own special privileges than others. You can't do that. Either everyone has one or no one has one. And again, common sense, right? You'd think that would just be obvious. Like, yeah, that's so, that's so obvious, so logical. The British state does not run off logic. It does not run off the overall construct and, and how equal and how logical it is. It doesn't work that way. The British state works iteratively, brick by brick, just just adding things step by step at a snail's pace. It's absurd. And, it, and it's absurd because it gives places like Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland too much of a voice, which I know people in those parts of the country won't like me saying, but it's true. And it gives England too little of a voice, uh, e e even in terms of its population. It allows radical parties that don't really get that many votes, like the SNP, to have their own illusionary first minister and their own majorities in parliament. And it's, uh, by the way, by the way, did you know that the Scottish parliament, and I think the other parliaments, use proportional representation? So that's even more mind-blowing, like we've got a first-past-the-post system nationally and a proportional representative system for their own devolved parliaments. Oh my God, this country is just ridiculous. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to have a stroke. Like, wh why is it so complicated? Like, why have we done this to ourselves? Uh, I will never, I will never understand. <sighs> but anyway, what if I told you that it gets worse, right? It's no, it's not just that we have an unrepresentative House of Commons. It's not just that we have devolved parliaments for some parts of the countries, but not others. <sighs> we also have our experts. So the House of Commons, you know, the Houses of Parliament are called the Houses of Parliament, not the House of Parliament. And there's one house, the House of Commons, which we all know about. But what if I told you that the House of Commons was actually just the lower house? There's another house. The upper house is the House of Lords, right? And if you think, if you think 
that the House of Commons is unrepresentative and undemocratic. If you think that the devolved parliaments are absurd, wait until you see how undemocratic and absurd the House of Lords is. Right Now, this really is something from the medieval era. So most British people don't have a clue what the House of Lords even is. They've probably seen it on television, but I imagine that most British people, if they saw this picture, which is the House of Lords, they wouldn't know what it is. They would think it was something to do with the royal family, which I suppose it is loosely. But they wouldn't know what a lord is. They wouldn't know what a peerage is. They wouldn't, they would have, they wouldn't have a clue. And the reason is because if British people knew what the House of Lords really was, it would be abolished instantly. So what is the House of Lords? The way the House of Lords works is... When legislation has been passed by members of parliament in the House of Commons, it doesn't just come into law, it gets passed to the House of Lords. And the House of Lords can then scrutinise the legislation. It can ask for amendments. It can say, I, I think this should be changed, blah, blah, blah. And they can delay uh, legislation from just being outright passed. Uh, one year delay for normal bills and one month max for economic bills. Because obviously economic bills are much more urgent typically than normal bills. So, right, so the way that the way that Britain works is that the House of Commons passes a law, right? So the the unrepresentative but elected MPs, they pass a law, but it doesn't just come into law then. It then gets passed to the House of Lords, and the House of Lords, after scrutiny, can delay it, or they can pass it, but when they've passed it, then royal assent makes it law, right? So it goes to the House of Commons, it goes to the House of Lords, and then it gets passed to the royals to sign it into law, right? So the House of Lords kind of functions like a gatekeeper, a middleman, from the Parliament, from, from the House of Commons to royal assent. Like, the royals aren't going to deny a law, right? The royals just sign whatever's been put in front of them. So, but, but the House of Commons doesn't have a direct line to the royals, per se. It's the House of Lords that does. They're the middlemen. They're the gatekeepers. And so the question is then, who, like, who are these lords, right? Like, who are they? To have the ability to delay laws that have, for a month or even a year, that the elected members of parliament have passed, like, who are these people? Well, get this, they're not elected. That's right, the lords are unelected, okay? So we have, go back, we have unelected gatekeepers in the middle to scrutinise laws that the elected members of parliament have passed. So again, well, you must be thinking, well, damn, these lords, they must be like some real, like, knowledgeable experts, right? Because the, po the point of the House of Lords is, like, a parliament ran by the people, ran by its MPs, can sometimes get out of hand, right? And so the House of Lords is meant to temper them. It's meant to say, ah, hang on a minute, have you really thought this through? Like, are you not just doing this because the emotions are high? Like, let's scrutinise this. Let's go through this professionally and make sure that this law that you're passing actually makes sense. The lords are not meant to be, part, are not meant to be loyal to any partic particular political party. They're meant to be loyal to the state. They're meant to have the stability of the state. And they're meant to be like the greater good, right? And so you must be thinking like, well, these lords, like, they must be like, some, like the, the wise men. Like, they must be like some of, some of the most knowledgeable, intelligent, smart people in the country, right? <laughs> Who are the Lords? Well, first we have the Lords Spiritual, right? And the, the Lords Spiritual is, is people who are high-ranking in the Church of England. People often forget that the UK is not America, right? We don't have a separation of church and state. So, and so the church is part of the state, and it finds that part in the House of Lords. And so high-ranking people in the Church of England, like bishops and archbishops, you can see the, uh, the, church, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Wembley, who I think is a pathetic man. Uh, you know, he's a lord. And, and you know, I, I can imagine many, many British people, or many religious people, would be watching this going, damn, that's pretty based, right? Like, oh, wow, like a, a religious uh, foothold in, in, in the parliaments. And it's like, well, don't celebrate because the Church of England hasn't belonged to Christ in a generation. The Church of England is essentially a bunch of hippies uh, whose only job it is is to steer young men, driven religious men like myself into the arms of Islam. There's, uh, in my opinion, there's almost nothing Christian about it. And if you want, if you want evidence of that, these guys use affirmative action to artificially inflate the amount of ladies into the Lord's spiritual, right? And so, you know, in the past, 
back when the Church of England was actually Christian, only men could be bishops and archbishops and priests and deacons, etc. But then when the Church of England converted from Christianity to progressivism, it allowed women into the clergy, into the ranks. And so because all the lords spiritual in the House of Lords, the high ranking guys, were all men, they said, oh, well, well, for the next 10 years, we'll make it so it's all women. Right. So anyone who gets a promotion is going to be a woman. Which, again, shows how, one, not Christian they are, and two, how ridiculous this situation is. Like, you can, you can become a lord because of your genitalia. Yeah, it says a lot. So, so, yeah, if you're religious, don't celebrate this. This is not a win for Christianity. This is not a win for religious people. This is a historical artifact that has converted to the newfound state religion and is absolutely ridiculous. And, and it's, by the way, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous even if you are a Christian, in my opinion. Second, as if that couldn't get any more ridiculous, we have the hereditary peers. And hereditary peers are people who simply inherited their peerage from their family through zero work, effort, or sometimes even desire of their own. So let's say 400 years ago, your, your great, 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 great grandfather was the friend of the king, and he makes you a, a lord, like he makes him a lord. That title gets inherited to his son, to his son, to his son, to you. Yes, really. This exists. So in 1999, the then Labour government tried to purge all hereditary peers from the House of Lords, which led to the House to threaten to wreck the government's agenda by delays, right? Because remember, the House of Lords can delay bills that are coming in. And one of these hereditary peers, a guy called Michael Onslow, said, I'm happy to force a division, which is a, you know, a discussion, on each and every clause of the Scotland Bill, which was a bill that was discussed at the time. Each division takes 20 minutes and there are over 270 clauses, right? So they're essentially bragging, like, hey, listen, you want to get rid of us, us hereditary peers? Well, tough, because if you do, we're going to drag your government, your agenda to a standstill because we can do that. Which, again, just goes to show how pitiful, pathetic and absurd uh, this, these hereditary peers are, who, remember, they've done nothing to deserve this position whatsoever other than be born into the right family, and how childish they are uh, in, in, in response to having that privilege in the first place, rather than simply putting their hands up and saying, you know what, yeah, this is ridiculous, like, I clearly don't deserve to be here, this is absurd, just, like, let, let's get rid of hereditary peers, I'll, I'll humbly agree, Instead, they, they pulled the tantrum and went, no, no, uh, no I'm going to get in the way of how the bloody countries ran with over 60 million people. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to willingly make the country worse for over 60, 60 million people just so I can keep my pathetic little title that everyone knows I didn't earn anyway. It's absolutely absurd. Then we have political appointees and oh, political appointees are, are people who are appointed, you know, given a peerage usually due to some sort of political service. So think like ex-prime ministers or ex, ex-important ex ministers. But sometimes, you know, th these can be controversial because they don't seem to make any sense, right? There's no strict criteria, per se, apart from a minimum age requirement of, of who can be uh, of who can be appointed a lord politically. A good example of, of this is Baroness Owens. And I'm not going to call them a baroness because it's ridiculous and, in, in my view, they don't deserve to be one. I, I challenge everyone to pause this lecture, open up a new tab, go on Wikipedia, type in Baroness Owens, right? This is someone who became a baroness, which is a, a form of, of a peerage. They're in the House of Lords. And they're only 31 at the moment. And their entire, the reason I say go on their Wikipedia page is because their entire Wikipedia page is like a Sherlock Holmes novel. It's just a bunch of question marks. And the question marks are people going, why is she here? <laughs> how, did she, how, did she become a, how did she become a lord? Like, why is she here? Like, what, what is going on? Like, how did she get to this position? Because her career, well, she didn't really do anything. Like, no one really knows who she is. I mean, she, she worked for some people in the Conservative Party, I think, for about a month. But but what what did she do that was so exceptional that that brought her in the House of Lords? Again, it's 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 seemingly arbitrary. It's it's like no one really understands, no one really knows, which again just adds to the ridiculousness of the House of Lords system. 
And then lastly, we have actual experts, right? And these are people who have achieved a lot in their specific field of expertise. So for example, here, the picture there is of Alan Sugar. I don't really like Alan Sugar, but he is the, the host of The Apprentice in the UK, a multimillionaire, a very successful businessman, and, you know, Alan Sugar would probably have some insight worth listening to, right? It's probably wise that he is a lord, because when it comes to business, matters of business, matters of legislation revolving business, probably has some things to say worth listening to. But, you know, the overall point is, why aren't these the only ones there? Like, like, sure, sure, and, and, like emphasize that, like, doesn't that make the most sense? Because you look at the House of Lords here, the Lord Spiritual, the Hereditary Peers, the Political Appointees, these, again, are, are medieval baggage. I mean, I'm a religious man myself, but the Lord's spiritual does not, re the Church of England doesn't represent religious people whatsoever. Hereditary peers is literally something from like the feudal era that, that is insulting to everyone on the island. Political appointees are arbitrary and make no sense and kind of make the House of Lords look like even more of a joke than it already is. Surely none of these should be a thing. Really? And, and the only people in the House of Lords should be actual experts, like actual ev like people who have achieved something really well in the in their field of expertise. And yeah, that kind of just makes complete sense. And that's exactly what the House of Lords should be. Rebrand the House of Lords into, I don't know, the House of Expertise, the House of Experts. I don't know, you could give it a cool House of Talents. That's quite a cool one. And you, you then let the public petition to put forward experts from, from, from whatever field of expertise to join the house, right? So, for example, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm just pulling names out my backside here. Gordon Ramsay, right? I think everyone would agree. Gordon Ramsay, he knows quite a lot about food, right? Or, uh, I, I don't know, <laughs> he's not British, but Bill Gates, right? Bill Gates knows a lot about IT. I know, I know, like, it doesn't make sense, but you get the point, right? Like, you let the public petition to say, hey, I like this guy, he seems to know his stuff, you know, I want him in the house of experts, right? And then he, then he or she can can scrutinize the legislation uh, and, and essentially make the put, put the government to account, make the laws better, which is exactly what the House of Lords is meant to do. Not this stupid nonsense we have today where it's like, oh, you're part of the right religion in the right sect and, and you've you've had a, a affirmative action to promote you or you were born into the right family, or you arbitrarily received a peerage for some unknown reason that no one can understand. Get rid of all this garbage, get rid of this medieval n n nonsense, and, 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 and let's stop with the titles as well. Lords, baronesses, barons, earls. I know some conservative people will get angry at me for saying that, but it's pathetic, it's ridiculous. Like, what, what year is this? E if I was given a, peer a peerage tomorrow, I would feel embarrassed to go around calling myself Lord Hexagon. It sounds like a comic book villain. Everyone with the title Lord sounds like they're from Marvel or something like that. It's absurd. But, but you know, again, this, this this would help the House of Lords a lot because it makes it democratic, right? You The people have a say, but it also... It also makes it meritocratic as well, because they're not just going to let any fool in, right? It, this isn't, it shouldn't be a popularity contest. It really should be people who have really, uh, uh, they've really exceeded expectations in the, in the field of expertise as judged by the public. Like the public may not trust politicians, but they would certainly trust these guys, uh, right? That's, that's what I think the House of Lords should be. And that brings me on to number five, wrapping up here. Tell me this isn't better, right? I mean, really... Every single thing that we've just gone through, tell me this isn't better. We have right now, we've got a ridiculously unrepresentative first past the post false democracy that can easily be gerrymandered, manipulated and lead to political apathy and extremism. Or we adopt proportional representation and then we have a logically representative proportional true democracy that cannot be gerrymandered, manipulated and actually gives everyone in the country a voice, however big or small. Again, tell me that isn't better. Tell me that doesn't just make more sense. Or again, with devolved parliaments, rather than having a devolved set of petty kingdoms masquerading as a real country where some parts have greater autonomy, privileges and powers than others, why not become a real country? Right, A real country where all parts of it have autonomy, privileges and powers. We either all have a parliament or we all don't, but we're all the same. We're all one nation. Makes sense, right? Or, you know, again, rather than an unelected clique of, in my opinion, corrupted clergymen, hereditary nonsense and unjustified political appointees with some actual experts sprinkled in a little bit, 
why not just have the experts, right? Why not just have a group of highly acclaimed people in their field of expertise, of which are so widely respected by the public that they elected them directly? Again, all these changes are just better. They're logical. They make complete sense. Many people in other countries would look at this and go, why on earth is this not obvious to everyone in the country? Because it is obvious. And, you know, and so my overall message here is get a move on Britain. Get a move on. Look, I'm, I, I love tradition. I love our history in many ways. I'm all for it. But when it gets in the way of how the system, of, of, how, of how people actually live today and, 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 and the, the system makes it harder for people to be represented in Parliament, it makes it harder for, uh, for the country to feel united, it makes it harder for, for, the, for the country to, to pass laws and have proper scrutiny, uh, th then, in my opinion, tradition and history goes out the window. Right? I don't want Britain to become a grey, neoliberal, boring state with glass skyscrapers and, and, and no character. Right? That's not what I want. But the, the British democracy as it is right now is an absolute joke. And I don't know how anyone could possibly watch this and come to any other conclusion. And so that's all. You know, that wraps it up. Uh, you know, thank you very much to the, to the patrons on the Wall of Fame. Uh, it's very kind of you to, for your support. But, you know, comment below. What are your thoughts on the absurdity of British democracy? Bit of a, a bit of a, a loaded question, I suppose. Maybe some people like the unrepresentative first-past-the-post House of Commons. Maybe some people like the unequal devolution of the UK. Or maybe some people who really need to get their head checked might like the House of Lords and its <sighs> free quarters nonsense. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I just, I, I don't think there's a point of talking about British elections and the parties and who's going to win and all this stuff when the system itself and the state itself needs a complete reform. Reform. See what I mean? Because it is, because it, it it's, again, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it's absurd. Like this country has one, like it's half in the 21st century and half in, 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 in the 11th century. You know, it, it's, we need to get rid of the baggage. We need to modernise more. And that's not something that uh, you might expect me to say as someone with socially conservative beliefs. But, you know, Britain really needs it. Like, conservatives in Britain shouldn't be afraid of modernising the state. It, because it th things like this is what makes people progressive. They hear this nonsense. They see conservatives support it. They see progressives oppose it. And it draws them into their arms. no. You can have socially conservative beliefs and think that the way that the British state is ran today is archaic and absurd. All right, that's all. Uh, find me elsewhere, maybe on Twitter or whatever. And uh, thanks for watching.